Good afternoon. I'm Michelle Stark, the Community Affairs Officer for the Oakdale Police Department. Joining me today are members of the community, Chief Bill Sullivan from the Oakdale Police Department, Pastor Paul Tillman from Hartwood Church, Sergeant Nick Newton from Oakdale Police Department, Chief Jeff Anderson from the Oakdale Fire Department, and community member Freddie Giles. The purpose of coming together today is to answer questions that we've received from residents about the events that took place in Oakdale following the death of George Floyd while in custody of the Minneapolis Police Department. While we would have preferred to do an in-person community meeting, we are trying to balance providing information to the public and limiting gathering time during this time of a health crisis. I'm going to help facilitate those questions that we've received from various platforms, along with community member Paul Tillman and Freddie Giles, as we work through a conversation um, of our panel of community members. So we're gonna just get started right away. And one of the most frequent questions from the residents has been, what do you think of the video and the actions of the Minneapolis police officer? And in follow-up, what's the Oakdale Police Department's policy? Nick, you want one? Sure. Um, I've been a police officer for 19 years, and when I watched that video, there was really three feelings I had. Uh, the first was disgust. The second was confusion. And then later it was anger. And disgust was because I don't know how a person could do that to another human being. Uh, that man was handcuffed. There is no reason to have a knee on that person's neck. Next was confusion. Uh, I had been a law enforcement trainer for 15 years in my department. And I could say it's embedded in our culture of our organization that that would never happen in Oakdale. Uh, because we have, you know, sanctity of life is what we follow, a duty to intervene. These are all things that are part of our policy, but more of our policy, it's, it's part of our culture that we hold each other accountable for those things. And uh, <coughs> anger, uh, I'd say anger because, you know, there's so many good police officers that go out and do the job for the right reason and try to do the job the right way and they've worked so hard to work with the community, you know, to build that trust and legitimacy that we're trying to have with our community. And those several minutes on that video eroded years of us building that trust with our community. Why do you think um, we saw the protests come to Oakdale in the residential area? Yeah, that was a unique thing for us. We, uh, the Oakdale Police Department, we had no idea that there was a Minneapolis police officer that lived in our city at that location. And following the events that happened in Minneapolis, uh, there was groups coming to protest at the residence where that Minneapolis police officer, police officer lived. And uh, that was a unique situation for us because that was a, it's in a residential neighborhood, you know, and, and to deal with the amount of people that started showing up became uh, a little bit of a, of a difficult situation for us as a department because we're, it was a delicate balance of we really wanted people that were there for the right reasons to be able to, to have their First Amendment right to, to, to speak about what happened and uh, it was a form of healing for a lot of people. So that was a, a, a delicate situation for us as a department to make sure we're responding not only to the, the people that are protesting but also making sure we have an environment that's safe for everyone that lives in the, the area. Chief, do you have any comments on? Yeah, you know, uh, Chief Arredondo in Minneapolis uh, did a news conference today and he had, I think, probably the greatest line I've heard about this. Uh, he said what troubled him the most was he saw no humanity in it. Uh, when he watched the video and saw what happened, it made no sense because he said, you're, you know, if you ever have a conflict between what the policy is and what's actually occurring, you hope that just your basic humanity rises above that to help you make a decision about what to do and he didn't see any of that in in that incident and I thought that was a really really very important kind of observation 
uh, that when all else fails, you just act like a human being. And I think that in this particular case, it certainly didn't have that appearance. So another question that frequently came up, um, you know, from people who were peacefully gathering um, at the location um, and wanted to hear their voices heard is, why are we protecting the house of a murderer? Um, do one of you want to speak to that? Yeah, you know what, I can, I can take that one. Really, what, we, what we're protecting is the rule of law. And so our, our goal is to protect life first, obviously and property next, even when it's not something that other people may prefer, even may not be comfortable for us uh, to think it does lend the appearance that you're protecting the property of someone who did a horrible thing. But the reality is it's the rule of law and we protect uh, everyone's life, everyone's property. And for us, the biggest concern was if anything happened at that home, what was gonna happen to the uh, adjoining properties, which I think was one of the biggest concerns Chief Anderson had, and he'd be better able to address that. But. Correct, okay. Chief, do you, do you have comments on that? Yeah, uh, but like Chief Sullivan said, uh, our concern from the fire department perspective there that there were, uh, you know, there were rumors and threats on social media and so forth about uh, burning the, the property. And uh, again, our charge is with saving lives and property. And uh, so that was our biggest concern. Uh, there is that should that house uh, uh, catch fire uh, that we uh, wanted to make sure we protected uh, the residents uh, next door and in the area and then uh, you know uh, control that fire put the fire out if we could so and then you have all those dynamics that go with that of how do you protect the fire crew going in if you have a large crowd of people some of whom are turning hostile you know, how do you get access? How do you keep them safe at, at the same time? And it gets to be a pretty, pretty complicated kind of dynamic. Right, right. And I think that lends us right to the question of um, the escalation of deployment of mobile field force. And uh, um, I think um, Freddie may also be able to add a voice into that as uh, someone who assembled very peacefully um, but the comment of why was mobile field force deployed, we were peaceful, you know, mm -hmm. and how does that escalate and try to give some of our um, viewers, you know, an idea of why that happens um, and what triggers that. In Oakdale, you know, we have 32 officers and not all of them can be exactly on that location, on that scene, because we have to provide services throughout the city. So we really depend on a resource of other agencies which make up the Washington County Mobile Field Force team. And they're essential for us as a crowd management measure. You know, when I was out there on Wednesday, Thursday, and Friday, and that first Wednesday, you know, we tried to make a very soft approach of we're not wearing anything other than what we wear on a daily basis as a police officer and trying to make connections with with some some folks that are out there peacefully protesting and trying to set some of the the expectations of you know acknowledging that people are here for some very good reasons and we want to allow you and we embrace that you can have your first amendment rights but you know we ask that you are in these locations and we want you off to some of the neighbors' properties. And the biggest thing is that if this thing get, grows too large, we're going to probably have to come back and, and let you know that you're going to have to start moving to other locations, maybe across the street, because, you know, Helmo Avenue is a, was a, the, the major feeder street to that whole neighborhood. And um, eventually that's what happened is uh, some, some of the, the Helmo got blocked by vehicles and people, and it was too much for the few we had right there on scene to manage that. So we had to make a decision to call in mobile field force to assist with that. Okay. The other advantage to mobile field force, Michelle, is that they're, they are officers that are, are uh, particularly trained for crowd control activities. And that's important because they, they understand not only the dynamics of how crowds behave, um, but they also have been through enough training that they're not likely to panic and to overreact to situations 
prematurely. Right. And so there are times that it strategically is absolutely the best thing that you can do. And, and that was the reason that I made the decision to approve the deployment of Mobile Field Force, uh, because I think you're bringing in a group of folks who have the best chance of maintaining order and the best chance of also protecting the rights of the protesters because we know most protesters are there for peaceable purposes trying to have their voice heard but you get just enough people mixed into the crowd that have different kinds of of motives and it can spin out of control pretty quickly okay excellent thanks do you have I any comments like, i feel like i was out there and you guys, it, it was handled fine early by the Oakdale police, but once you en engage with the field force, mm -hmm. it created a different scenario. It, it, it sent a, more of a, a threatening, intimidating factor. Right. And if you say like they're trained to control crowds, it incited the, rep, mm -hmm. the crowds more than it actually did control them. Mm -hmm. So when, I, when you sit there and you put those guys in the front, front lines, they came up, and it was more of intimidation than anything. Right. They, they didn't say one word, nothing was spoken, and it was just to intimidate. Mm -hmm. That's how I felt personally. Yeah. And we, I felt like we didn't escalate anything or you know, the, the, the crowd never got really unruly. We understood that you guys do have a job. Right. I guess, what, what exactly entailed you personally to bring them out there? What point did you feel like the crowd got out of control? I think for, for uh, me, Freddie, the, the decision becomes the number of people in the area and the information that we're receiving from the site in terms of crowd demeanor, behavior, that sort of thing, uh, that it's actually a preemptive kind of approach to it to try to minimize the likelihood of problems. I do know what it looks like. I mean, it does appear that you're, you're escalating it, but the reality is it, it would be I can't imagine a circumstance that I would have done differently because I would never want to endanger either the officers that are already on the scene or the crowd itself because we were too shy about uh, demonstrating potential authority. Uh, there are times that it actually is to our advantage uh, to show that strength because it keeps problems from occurring and we just cannot let police officers or demonstrators get hurt because we're shy about deploying that kind of, of what appears to be force, and I do understand that. Now, Nick can probably better address the idea of why they don't engage with you verbally and that sort of thing from yeah. his training. Yes, so for Mobile Field Force, I was a member of Mobile Field Force, although I was not in that capacity when uh, all the events happened in Oakdale. But uh, they, have, they have orders <laughs> by their, their squad leaders to yeah, don't engage in any conversation, you are just there to, to hold the line and, and just stay there and stay put until you're told to do something else. I understand that, but that also creates, you know, it, it takes and it puts it as a uniform versus the people. Mm -hmm. When the people really want to see the empathy of police officers and things of the such, that we want to see you as human beings rather than a deployed right. force. I mean, I get it that there are things that are needed but at the same time, we want to see your human side. I, I basically felt like I stared at robots who were only there against me, rather than looking at individuals who were like me or like-minded. I didn't see that. I did when, when that's deployed, that's what we or I, I personally feel right. or felt. Yeah, right. And you had mentioned moment. that you two had a dialogue all for that, this. Yes. And then bringing in the mobile fill force, that's kind of. That ends the conversation. But, yes, mm -hmm. and it, there was no more dialogue after right. that. It was looking at people where it's like me and Nick, we were able to speak. We could understand, I understood he wanted what he wanted, what the goals were, and I also tried to accomplish that on the other side. Right. I, I get it, there are people who come and they change yeah. scenarios and things of the such, but it, it got rid of the dialogue. It became just a blank, where right. it was us versus you, and now where do we go? Right, understood. It's a face-off. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, you know, just to speak a little further on that, on, on, on Thursday, you know, it took, we took a, even a softer approach at the beginning, right? Yep. And I tried to go out there and engage some dialogue with the, some of the community members that were out there. And, uh, you know, things kind of spun out of control a little bit. The road got blocked again. People came with loudspeakers and were demonstrating. 
And we managed that just with our, our folks from Oakdale there. Correct. And there was no, okay, we're not gonna call Mobile Field Force, Let's, I think we can, we can deal with this. And eventually we did clear the roadway and then it, it was peaceful and we, we retreated and backed off and, and we're, we're fine with everything that was going on. Then the property damage started happening. Um, rocks are being thrown at the house and rocks were bouncing off the house hitting the neighbor's house of folks that were on their deck. So then we had to re-intervene again. And that's where I made contact with a, with a uh, protester that was one of the organizers. And you know, we both felt the same thing. Like, I agree that's wrong. And I'm gonna talk to people about this. And then we're like, okay, this can't continue. Because if, if it continues, this is, this is spinning out of control and we can't handle this on our own here. And he went and he talked to a group that he believes is the ones throwing the rocks. And it stopped, we retreated again, and 10 minutes later, the house is getting you know, hit with rocks again, and that, that's the time we had to say, okay, we, we have to call Mobile Field Force uh, on the front end of this so it doesn't get worse. All right. I, 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 I agree with that. I believe that was maybe, what, day three of it, that, that the, the rock incident. Because the other two days, there was nothing. First night, Mobile Field Force was in, put out. Everything was fine, they didn't push forward. Night two, Right. I don't think there was, there was no rocks thrown, there was nothing of the sort, but Mobile Field Force was engaged, right. and they actually pushed forward on that night. So there was a difference in the approach to the third day, because day two, we, we did it peacefully, and we were out there with the intentions on only being a voice. And then for Mobile Field Force to push tear gas and you know physically handle us and firing rubber bullets or whatnot, I'm not sure what they were, but I didn't get hit personally. But, you know, you see it, and you see the escalation. Now, third day, people are coming with a different mindset mm -hmm. because it's being, you guys have ramped up. Now the people are going to think different. Like, right. okay, now we have to come with a different mindset rather than the same calm demeanor we had the day before, where I, I can say probably day two, the worst thing that would happen was there's was paint in the driveway, and someone literally I watched with the finger wrote killer on the drive on the garage. Mm -hmm. I yelled at them personally. And you know, there's officers that can vouch and see me trying to control the crowd. Right. But the escalation of that force changes the dynamics of what can be peaceful, just the presence of them. Oh, and I think that's the great part of the conversation, Freddie, because we see the same thing. We're, we're both essentially saying the exact same thing. We think that there are some in your group that are escalating. You think we're escalating because mobile field force comes out. And I think that's the, that's the beauty of being able to sit here right now and say, here's why we did that. And you're saying, here's what it looks like. It helps yeah. all of us. Okay. Yeah. So, and it, go ahead. Oh, uh, I think the, uh, you know, and I, I certainly want law enforcement to be protected. I don't want you out there just exposed right. and, and, and be, being able to get hit with rocks or shot or anything like that. Um, but this idea of what it feels like is a militarization right. of, of the right. law enforcement. And this is not a cop thing. I think this is a human nature thing. The more protection I have, whether that's physical protection or economic protection or legal protection or cultural protection, the more aggressive I can be mm -hmm. because I'm safe. And so what I, I wasn't there that night, but the idea of, okay, now you know, we're a mobile field force. Right. We've got our stuff on. We can now push. Um, and so that, that's my concern. It's like, oh, well, is it just by virtue of their presence uh, is an aggressive stance? Right. There's no need to act aggressive as well. Mm -hmm. And I, I think that's a challenge. That, that is a challenge, yeah. No, there's no, no question about that. Mm -hmm. I think that is. And that's also, frankly, part of the crowd dynamic as well. That, that anonymity of being part of a crowd yes. also causes people to throw the rocks, do the things they normally would never do. Yeah, yeah think so they we both, right. Yeah. They, they, so we both have to share on that one, yeah, mm -hmm. no question about it. Mm -hmm. um, does that escalation of force with mobile field force, um, what type of warnings or how, how can a crowd comply um, once that is moving forward or that push happens, um, you know, can you explain that just a little bit so 
um, the listeners understand that there is some form of compliance um, that needs to take place. Yeah. Yeah, so our mobile field force is, uh, takes a, a very strategic and very slow process. They really want to slow down the event the, the most they can. Mm -hmm. And, you know, when they make that, those line of officers, right, and that decision is made that, all right, this is a declared an unlawful assembly. The loudspeakers turned on and very clear, concise directions saying, you know, this is declared an unlawful assembly. You have 15 minutes to leave this area or you could be arrested. And then it's repeated again, a total of three times to make it very clear to people that not only are we telling you that if you stay here, it's, uh, you, you could be arrested. That's not our goal, but you could if you, if you stay. Um, you know, two, giving you direction. If you're not from the area, they're actually giving you direction saying if you just walk, you know, that direction, southbound on Helmo, you can find your way out of this area. And, you know, given very clear, concise direction on what where, where our expectations are. Okay, and then and to rebuttal that, I, I sat on Helmo. My truck was vehicles parked there on Helmo. I physically could not hear one command that was given through that loudspeaker. So I, every time they would say something or anything that they did say, I no longer could hear that. So the, the thought that you're giving out direct and clear it may be coming good from your side, but the people don't hear it. It's a, it's a crowd. It's loud and, and everything. But I didn't understand it until it was literally upon me, and you got or the mobile field force was pushing forward. So I mean, as far as you, I get it, they give out a command. I think day two, there was one one verbal command, and that was it. And then it was I felt like it went forward, but because that's only what I heard. So I can't say that they didn't give out right. three warnings or. A early amount of time but I only heard one time on the loudspeaker I didn't hear what they said but I only heard them on the loudspeaker one time so then once I get pushed upon now I'm feeling defensive and yet defenseless at the same time because I have no idea what's going because I had no intentions on being into an altercation where it was me versus you you or know that's really good to know though Frey because uh, that is something we can take back to the team because we, there actually are three commands given uh, before they start any movement. And if you only heard one of them, that would be something that we'd need to improve on yeah. uh, to make sure that the crowd was able to hear those commands properly. Mm -hmm. That's actually helpful to know. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Paul, do you want to continue with your questions? On oh, well, then, yeah. So I was at the city council meeting where it was decided not to have a curfew for mm -hmm. Oakdale. So, but uh, a common question that came in on Facebook groups and stuff as well. Why didn't we have one, especially when all the cities around us were having curfews? Right. So. Um, I was. I recommended to the city council that we not have a curfew, and there there were multiple reasons for it. Um, but I have to tell you, I think the most eloquent reason came from you at the meeting uh, when you made the comment about uh, if there's a curfew, the voices that need to be heard don't get heard. And I think that there was really a lot of truth to that. But we have. Mine were probably um, more, I guess, more strategically driven in the sense that we don't want to uh, endanger officers or residents, people that are there protesting. Once we establish a curfew, the impression in the community is that it'll be enforced. Anytime you make a rule or a law, you theoretically are going to enforce it. So we've automatically created the confrontation now for those who choose not to leave at 8 o'clock or 9 o'clock, whatever it is. And sometimes there can be a strategy to that. That may be the, mm -hmm. the end of the discussion for you. Uh, but in our particular case, we wanted to make sure that we weren't uh, putting people in harm's way that didn't need to be. We wanted to make sure that we weren't punishing residents who were not part of this. All you're doing is going out to pick up a pizza and, and all of a sudden you're getting stopped by the police because you're violating curfew. We don't want to we don't want to pull people into that circle when they don't need to be either. So for us, it was a concern about do we create a confrontation uh, when we don't really need to? And in our case, we just felt we didn't need the curfew. Uh, we had, for the most part, a contained area that was relatively easy for us to keep contained. 
we didn't have it spread all over the city like Minneapolis and St. Paul did, where you might have some different considerations. But uh, Pastor Tillman and a number of different uh, residents showed up at that meeting and were very supportive of the idea of not having one as well. And I think that that was helpful to us in making our case. So, but I think you may want to touch more on what why you said what you did there. Yeah, I um, basically what I said is a curfew allows those who are in power to silence those who are not in power and may not have a voice. Um, and at the time, there had been no no violence or anything in any of the protests here, so there was no there was no reason to crack down in that way. So, um, like I said, I, I personally felt that the council made a good decision on that. And mm. I think being reactionary, just because everybody else does it, doesn't mean we have to do it. I mean, we don't use that excuse with our children. All my friends are doing it, so. Right. Right. Exactly, <laughs> yeah. Um, I think our department very much so um, does not do things just because We've everybody tried. does We have things. tried, yes, so. we have. But it <laughs> so. does, so you're, you're right, Paul, oh, my goodness. It, it just spreads like wildfire. The communities, most uh, most of the chiefs that I'm aware of are recommending against curfews for the very reasons we've talked about, and most of the communities enacted them uh, because everybody next to them did, and they just kept working around, and, and pretty soon it becomes exactly that because everybody else is. So, Excellent. Okay. Paul, do you have another question? Oh, yeah, that you'd the like only to other call? concern I've heard from citizens is with the, uh, the defunding of the Minneapolis de Police Department. Uh, even though that's not our city, what, is, what does that mean for, I guess, law enforcement in general? What ramifications could it have for us here? Uh, defunding the police, it's, it's an idea uh, that is worth discussion in the sense of what are, where are your resources being allocated? Um, the idea of just arbitrarily removing money from the police because that's going to change something is not factual. That, that will not happen. In fact, it's going to create even more problems. Um, the reality is, is that the police are the, are the exclusive government agency that people call for just about everything and who respond at just about any time. And as a result, we've taken on lots of different missions I think it's worth exploring what do we do about homelessness? What do you do about unemployment issues? What about juvenile crime? There are lots of things that we could apply resources toward, but we need to be doing it in a real thoughtful kind of manner, not in a sense a retaliatory manner that we're going to take some funding away. I saw New York City is talking about taking 150 million from their police department and, and in their budget that's, that's a lot of money even for them. Uh, but what is the purpose of doing that? Do you have some clearly identified idea or, or plan on what you're gonna do with that reallocation? Right now it just seems kind of punitive and that it won't actually be effective. I, th I think the assumption is for a lot of people that it just means that Minneapolis will not have any police. Yeah. I don't think that's true. It, I, it'll never happen. <laughs> yeah. That'll, it, it obviously, in, in a perfect world, that'd be a wonderful thing, but it won't happen. They're going to have all kinds of challenges. They have their charter. They have union contracts. They have all kinds of things that they need to talk about to even think about disbanding a police department. Uh, but under the circumstances, you need to remember that in Minneapolis, there are going to be hundreds of thousands of residents who support the police department and who don't think that disbanding it or defunding it in any way is a good idea. And so it's not going to be as simple a procedure, I think, as some of their council members make it sound. Uh, but I will say that there is always an opportunity to have a discussion about where your resources are going. Does it make sense to be doing what you're doing? Or should another agency be doing it more effectively? Or how you build up your community exactly. with neighborhood yeah. watch groups and community policing. Right. Yeah, exactly. So, Freddie, we want to get to your questions. and. Um, let your voice be heard today. Okay. Um, I had a question of why aren't police officers held accountable for their actions and or to a higher standard? Mm -hmm. That was a question that I asked and it kind of goes into the thing where officers have complaints and they're not being reprimanded right. for them. Well, what goes into that so that people can know? That, it's a really good question, Freddie. The, here's what happens. See, the we want folks to understand that officers um, 
have many privileges and protections. They have due process rights, just like most other employees do. And so it's not as simple as someone walks in, makes a complaint, and then the officer's disciplined. We literally need to prove that, you know, kind of beyond a reasonable doubt for the sake of discussion, that it actually did occur. Uh, the officer should have that kind of protection. I think folks need to understand that just because someone complains doesn't mean that something was done improperly. Uh, oftentimes we'll get complaints that are based on either a misunderstanding of what policy and procedure is. Uh, sometimes, uh, I hate to say it, but sometimes you get complaints because there are people who are trying to get their charges dismissed who think that if I make a complaint about the cop, they'll dismiss my citation. The trick for us is saying, okay, which of these complaints are legitimate? Which of them have a preponderance of the evidence? And then when that happens, do I have the grounds to discipline them and sustain it? And one of the, one of the problems being complained about in policing right now is the arbitration process. So let's say we discipline an officer, under their union contract, they can grieve that, and an independent arbitrator comes in and hears it, and the independent arbitrator decides whether or not to sustain that level of discipline. And there's an impression that the arbitrators won't do that, that they won't hold the police accountable. And, and there's times I think I felt that way, frankly, that I think that there were cases that termination should have been upheld or whatever throughout the United States in all these different kinds of cases. Um, but the reality is that's the system today. That's the way the state of Minnesota is designed. And as a matter of the rule of law, that's how the whole process works. So the state legislature could fix that by modifying the arbitration rules as an example. But that's not going to be an easy fix either because unions and, and other employee organizations are going to argue the other side of that, that we need those kind of protections. What we can't do, Freddie, we can't blow you off. That's what we have to work really hard at, and I think that our, I think our supervisors do an outstanding job of that, of really trying to take a look and say, is there, is there a legitimate problem here? And even more importantly, is there a pattern of problems? I might not be able to prove this one, but is this the sixth complaint that I've got that's essentially the same? Uh, then we know we've got a problem that we need to deal with. And I think Minneapolis is going to be looking real hard at that now, how to go about that. And I guess this is a weird way of asking it, but do you do you personally believe there's like a blue code of silence? Is there is within the force itself where you guys protect one another? Let me say this. I, I would I would tell you this. If there's 18,000 cops in the United States, roughly something like or uh, 18,000 departments in the United States, there are going to be departments that may have a culture of that more than others. Yes, um, I think it's far less than it used to be. I think many, many years ago, uh, that might have been even more of a problem than it is now. I do think that there are times that there's great reluctance for officers to testify against one another. I mean, it can be a very difficult, very scary job. And um, it's hard to look at one of your coworkers and say, they did something they shouldn't have done here. I'm gonna report that to a supervisor. That's very uncomfortable. That's uncomfortable for cops. That's uncomfortable for doctors and nurses and all other kind of, of occupations that are regulated. Um, short version, it happens sometimes, I think. I don't think nearly as much as it used to, uh, but unfortunately, sometimes. I think we have a pretty good culture at the Oakdale yeah, Police Department. I think, I so think too. Uh, exactly what Nick was saying about, you know, that we've eroded a lot you know this feeling um, that's surrounding this event um, from that one officer and incident and now um, we have to regain that and establish the trust again and and i think um, overall oakdale police department has a good culture um, within it to do the right thing um, uh, for our community residents so uh, but keep, keep going. Okay, another question is, uh, during an event like the video, civilians were there on the side and they seen there was a problem. At what point can a civilian intervene without, you know, getting charges ramped up right. on them or anything of the such? What, what can we do 
as people who know right from wrong, can we intervene? What can happen? The best thing that happened was it was videoed. And after the video, somebody needs to call. You know, uh, Chief Aradano was making that point today that it, somebody should dial 911 and say, you gotta get a supervisor down here. This, this is going really bad. Uh, and I think to physically intervene yourself would be a really bad idea the, because you'd be seen as somehow interfering in that arrest or trying to hurt the officer. Um, but I think it would have been very appropriate for someone to have called and said, you need to get a supervisor down here. The, this is bad stuff. Yeah. With, with that being said, that it's, it still would be too late. So it, yeah, it, right. it's kind of it it, it's kind yeah. of the point of like, do we have anything? That would, I mean, you guys, it comes off as police officers are kind of invincible. Right. At that point, there was individuals, a firefighter, off-duty fire person. She wanted to intervene. There's nothing she could possibly do, and it kind of puts. It, it feels as if we can't do anything. I think I understand that, but I, I actually think we bore the burden of that one because I think that the other cops that were there should have done something. Yeah, well, yeah. yeah it, shouldn't have, it shouldn't have been an issue of waiting for someone in the crowd to have to do that. And I know that's a really uncomfortable spot for cops to be in, especially new ones. Right. That's gonna be really tough to do. But the bottom line is you have a person who, who is potentially dying and, and you need to respond to that. Uh, I would never encourage a citizen though to get into the middle of something like that. Um, it, it just wouldn't be a good idea. I understand. Any other follow-up questions, Freddie? <laughs> well, I got I got another question, just kind of in the instance of being civilians and knowing our rights and what we can and can't do, and like in the fact of like being detained. Like, there's times when you know you've done nothing wrong, right? And you comply, and there's still police officers are wrong, and we file complaints or whatever it seems like it doesn't happen like at what point can we stand up for ourselves and be I don't know exactly how to say it like I can only give an example like I was arrested at the age of 16 falsely because they thought I was my father who was 40 years older than I and I was taken down for his warrants or whatever after he deceased they became warrants I what can I do I I, I went along with what they said they were wrong took me down to the police station, dropped me off, nothing happens, right. you know? And I sit down there for hours and only to be harassed by the same officer hours after, an hour after I got let, brought back home. Right. You know, so what can I do in situations like that where I think I handled it right, but yet at the same time, handling it right didn't help me? I think handling it right probably did help you in the long run. Um, it, it didn't seem like it at the time because of the amount of time it took, but I think it demonstrated a uh, maturity on your part too that kept that situation probably from escalating even more the important thing for people to remember is there's a very simple question am I under arrest if I'm not under arrest am I free to leave and the officer is gonna have to answer that question what happens Freddie is people and, and I understand this people submit to authority and so they they may think that they have no alternative they have no choices they have to give a consent to search their vehicle, that sort of thing, and you don't. What we want people to do, though, is we want people to be conversational about it, not confrontational. And if you're conversational and you ask those simple questions, uh, you'll find that that detention will be very short unless there's probable cause to actually arrest you. Just stay patient, stay calm, uh, try not to get confrontational or overly defensive, and uh, I, I think it'll work out well for you. I'll say that that's a little bit difficult, but probable cause is a pretty broad. Yes, it bro is. It's broad. Yes. So how do we can determine, you know, we don't get to, we don't know the law right. verbatim. We, how do we know what probable cause is? We can only go off of you guys' work. Right. And, and that's, that's the trust that you've placed in us is, is to hope, and it doesn't always happen, but to hope that we are actually meeting the requirements of the law. If there's not probable cause, your, your charge will never get upheld in court, probably will never even get prosecuted because an attorney will get rid of it. Now that doesn't help you that night. That's still a tough night for you and I completely get that. But there are enough checks and balances in the system 
And then, frankly, after that, you also have the right to litigation. Uh, if you feel that you've been improperly arrested or detained for some reason, you always have the opportunity to sue the agency. And that's a long process, and we understand all of that. But the fact is there are a number of checks and balances. Keep control of your emotions. Ask the right questions. And I think that you'll find you just won't have any problems then. Paul, do you have any other questions? Otherwise, we'll continue down the, the yeah. list, and, and we'll start on a closing. Okay. So. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Anybody else? Okay. Excellent. Is there a residency requirement for Oakdale Police Departments? And why not? No, there's not for Oakdale Police Department. I can't speak for Chief Anderson. I don't, I'm not sure what you do with fire service. No, we don't. So we have, you know, we have uh, well, volunteer firefighters, which <clears throat> it's not a residency requirement, but they have to live within a, a time distance from the fire station because they're, in that case, they're responding from home to the fire station. But our career uh, people don't have a, they don't have to necessarily be a resident of Oakdale. They have to live within a, a uh, 40 minute response time of the fire station. And in policing, uh, under Minnesota statutes, we can't require people to live in the community if you live in the metropolitan area. Uh, when you get out to greater Minnesota, you can establish standards like Chief Anderson's talking about that they do with the fire department. Um, but here we can't do that by statute. Uh, people get to live where they want to live. Excellent. Thank you. And so I'm going to just follow up with Chief Anderson. Um, there is a comment about are we in danger of the gas pumps or gas stations exploding in the area of the target address where we were concentrated in? Yeah. Uh, no, well, you know, certainly uh, uh, at a gas station, there's, you know, typically the tanks are buried underground and they're filled with petroleum products. So there is a potential for an explosion. I would say that that, that potential, if the gas station catches fire or whatever, is, is probably very slim to nil. Uh, it would be very low on my list of concerns uh, that, that the tanks would explode. There are a number of uh, mechanical safety uh, devices built into those tanks just to eliminate that sort of thing. Not to say that because they're mechanical, they could fail. So there is a very slight possibility of that. I mean, I guess I'll give a good example uh, over that that uh, you know few days of unrest when there was all the uh, fires in Minneapolis and St. Paul. A number of uh, gas stations were were burned during that period of time, and I'm not aware of a single explosion, you know, of the underground tanks or whatever that occurred in any of those fires. Okay, Chief, was there was there a concern about the pipeline marker that was there? Yeah, so no, we're aware there is a there's a buried underground pipeline uh, that runs actually just uh, to the west of the uh, the uh, target residence there, um, and now there's again little or no concern even even if there was a, a house fire or something in the area those lines are buried five six eight feet underground and uh, mm -hmm. so not really a big concern from our standpoint. Okay, thank you. Um, someone said the National Guard was deployed in Oakdale. Can anybody respond to that? Yeah, that was not true. That was the National Guard was never was never deployed here. Uh, there was absolutely there would have been no purpose for it here. There wasn't that kind of a need. Okay. Yeah, it wasn't the National Guard. I think people are getting the perception of the field force yeah. being sure. in their full riot gear. It looked as if they were National Guard. That could so be. They're standing yeah. with yes. riot shields, their weapons, they got helmets on and everything. It looked as if they were a military force. Yeah. They weren't, but yeah, that's, that could be. that's, yeah, that's be the mindset yeah. that people yeah. get from sure. seeing them. Right. Okay, thanks. Um, why do protesters not need a permit to block the streets? We have to get them for block parties. What to say? <laughs> That's a good one. Um, block party, planned event in advance. Traffic's going to be diverted. You know, in advance, all those things are happening. Protesters theoretically can be removed from the street. Uh, there are times that it's practical to just leave them in the street, but the reality is you, you can tell people to get off the traveled portion. Um, so the protesters don't need a permit if they are protesting an event that's part of breaking news. And that's what ends up happening in a situation like this one. This thing is evolving real rapidly. The protests are starting real rapidly. Uh, it, it would be inappropriate, I think, to even request somebody to get a permit for that. The right to protest exists. Uh, could we theoretically have said you have to stay off the travel portion of the roadway? Yes, we theoretically could have, but we had a pretty self-contained area. 
with a fairly large number of people, and I think it was more prudent uh, to leave people where they were. Uh, we obviously worked harder at keeping Helmo open because of the traffic flow, uh, but there were even occasions that it was better off just to close down Helmo because it's also safer sometimes for the protesters. Um, if people are running out into the street and that sort of thing, you don't want somebody to get run over. Um, I heard about looting in Oakdale, home invasions, is that true? No, no home invasions. Uh, we did have a couple issues with some businesses that mm -hmm. uh, were more of uh, thefts and, and burglaries of such, but uh, there's no home invasions um, or anything like that. Okay, excellent. That, that helps, I think, feel residents more secure, um, which is um, one of the issues is the comments of where are the updates and, you know, we're scared. And mm -hmm. that feeling was really felt by many of us in the police department that was watching social media, trying to respond um, carefully, providing public information, but also trying to keep that mission component. Um, so one thing that we can tell residents uh, in the city of Oakdale, if necessary, that we will provide that information uh, via code red, IPAWS, um, the integrated public safety alert system um, will pr provide that on next door, Facebook, Twitter. Um, unfortunately, at that time, you know, with all the moving parts and all hands on deck, um, we restricted that information a little bit for mission reasons, but uh, we definitely would have gotten alerts out if we felt that the safety of the immediate area uh, was necessary. And we did deploy code reds, you know, letting people know that if gas was used to keep uh, windows closed. Um, but we did not uh, publicize that broad throughout the city because it wasn't necessary. Uh, the rest of the city was not impacted. Um, and also that mostly people complied with staying out of the area for um, Helmo 17th Street, no extra pedestrian traffic or motor vehicle traffic. So that was helpful uh, for us as well, uh, that it was kind of self-compliance um, once we put those requests out via Code Red. So um, anything to add to that about public information or getting information out, you felt that the need was met um, for the mission? Yeah, I think, uh, like the chief said, I mean, these are really rapidly evolving events. I mean, especially on that Thursday, you know, we, we were going to have a meeting and then all of a sudden everyone was fearful of all the, the grocery stores and, and businesses being looted because they weren't happening you know, in St. Paul and Maplewood and, you know, so that was a, a big concern for us. So these things just were rapidly occurring. Yeah. And, and likewise, that's personal safety and business safety that, um, you know, it's, it's their decision making on their business plan, whether they're going to close and, and make those decisions as well. So, um, can the, could the fire department get into the area um, during the week of the protests? Yeah, I think, uh, you know, we, we were uh, uh, working closely. You know, Chief Sullivan and I were uh, together during most of that time, so we were working closely. We had uh, contingency plans at different times, mm -hmm. and so it really kind of depends on, you know, when, when an event, if a fire event occurred, um, uh, you know, how many how many people, how many protesters, what route we could take, so forth. But we had a number of different contingencies to get equipment into the area if we needed. And in fact, we did have uh, uh, the fire department in Oakdale runs the ambulance service or emergency medical services. So we were uh, providing uh, uh, EMS coverage uh, during the, uh, the events, um, although not right at the site. So we did have access in and out of there uh, for, for uh, you know, potential uh, patients for emergency medical services. Yeah, it really gets to be, that's a great point because it's an interesting challenge. Folks need to remember too that the rest of the city doesn't stop operating. Right. You're getting all the same normal calls that you're getting that, and that nobody says, okay, they're tied up on 17th and Helmo. We're not gonna call them for a couple of days. Uh, you get lots of calls for service. So you're also trying to manage those at the same time that you're having enough people at 
at where the civil disorder is occurring or the demonstrations or whatever it is. Um, and so that's a big challenge. It really is, especially in departments our size. Okay, I've got one last question. And um, w one of the questions is, why don't you arrest him? Um, why does it take so long mm. for charges for police officers? That's a, I'll tell you what, that's a powerful, powerful question. It should, no one should be arrested quickly unless all of the evidence that is potentially available is, is compiled, analyzed, and organized. Uh, to do it quickly does a disservice not just to that individual person, but also to the criminal justice system as a whole. So the last thing that any agency or prosecutor wants to do is react too quickly. Uh, and these are really uh, very difficult situations because you have someone that's using the authority of their job in their office, carrying out what they believe is their job, uh, someone horribly and tragically dies. It's not as clean cut as somebody walked in and killed them uh, kind of thing. And so the prosecutors also have to look at the evidence and say, do we have enough to sustain a conviction of some sort? Um, one of the things that people were, I think, confused about was why Oakdale police didn't run up to the house and arrest him. Exactly. Um, yes. Because first, there's no warrant for his arrest at that time, and the crime did not occur in Washington County. The crime, as charged out, occurred in Hennepin County, which means that Hennepin County has jurisdiction over it. And I think we explained that to a lot of people uh, the first couple of nights that we were up there. They thought somehow we were protecting him inside the house. And that was, in fact, not the case. There was no warrant for him at the time. So that didn't finally come until Friday. So, and then he was taken into custody then. But okay. I, I think Thank that's you. a challenge of, uh, I don't know whether it's cultural perception or, or anything, because I appreciate what you said. You know, somebody shouldn't be arrested quickly. Let's make sure we have the evidence. But I think from uh, black experience, the, the thought would be, and even your example, oh, I will get arrested first, and then if they have right. charges to hold me, then I will just stay in jail. And, and so I think that might have been part of what prompted the question is, if that had been me, and there was video of me on somebody's neck, I, I would have been in jail first, right. um, as opposed to getting to go home and, and wait till they build a case. And I, I think that's part of maybe what prompted questions like that. Yeah. Oh, I agree. Yeah, you're, you're right about that. You guys get the 72 hour hold. Why wasn't that applied for him? We, we had enough evidence. Well, we visually see it, a crime happening. Usually that seems to be enough. You guys get 72 hours to hold them. They made the charge within the 72 hours, right. I believe. Right. So it would have honestly helped a lot if you just did the detainment and did your questioning and figuring out to build the case because within that 72 hours of it being broken he was already arrested why wasn't that yeah. the same as if it were like you said a regular civilian because one one of the reasons <laughs> going to be uh freddie because he's acting under the color of law and so there's a there kind of a different standard there and you frankly have the situation of you want to make sure that whatever the officer did contributed to that death before you charge him the fact that he's kneeling on his neck is horrible to watch, but until you're certain you can prove that that course of conduct is what actually caused the death, you don't want to charge it out because what happens when you dismiss the charge? Right. Then we've got a whole nother level of drama because people are going to say, say the cop walks away, he doesn't get charged with it. So for Hennepin County, it's a horrendously difficult situation to be in. You really want to make sure you've got everything lined up appropriately before you do formal charging. Any other last questions or moving forward comments? I guess my, my question would be, what, what do we do as far as building up the community, the, the involvement between you guys, our relationships between police officers and the civilians themselves? How do you guys plan on building how can you build and like things, for an example, I would like to see officers like visit playgrounds or things of such with little kids, mm -hmm. start at an early age and build up. Like how else, what other ways do you think could possibly work to create that? You two just did it today. You know, I mean, what you did today is significant. It really is because it helps us. It gives us a viewpoint that we don't necessarily have. And you come here and you speak very frankly 
and you give your opinions and so the folks that are watching know we had some conversation before this all started too and uh, you guys have been very direct about the things that you think we can do better or the, the you know the observations that you've made as well I think that's huge one of the things I always remembered I had I had some training where they just continuously emphasized to us relationships are primary all else is derivative mm -hmm. everything flows from the relationship and so what we want to do is we want to have these kinds of conversations now uh, rather than doing it during a crisis and that I think will solve a lot of the a lot of the problems for us so for that I thank you two gentlemen for for taking the time to do this it's huge yeah that's how we'll move forward I appreciate everyone's participation today I'm hoping that we um, answer the community questions of course we are listening and um, if there are other questions don't hesitate to call and ask those questions right. and get those answers I think there's a um, a hesitation for folks not to call and bother the police and that is not in fact we want to hear from you and answer those questions and if you have an event in your community we want to be involved um, if you find something that is a trigger that could um, set positive uh, forces in motion in your neighborhood start a neighborhood watch invite us um, and and we'll come and see you and uh, uh, continue to develop those relationships mm -hmm. so. thank you all thank you very much thank you. appreciate thank it you.